I think we will get ready to start if you're ready, Billy. I've just got an introduction real quick. Um, so hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Laura Kasney and I'm a conservation director serving Southeast Nebraska for the AmeriCorps Common Ground Program. Uh, the Common Ground Program holds educational webinars and events about conservation issues such as water quality and conservation, clean energy, and soil health. Uh, we focus on educating the public and preserving Nebraska's natural legacy. A couple items before we start. If you have any questions during the presentation for Billy, please type those in the Q&A option uh, or the chat box below, but make sure to direct them to all panelists and attendees. Uh, Rita is our moderator tonight. She is also a conservation director with Conservation Nebraska and will be here to answer any technical or general questions you may have. At the end of this presentation, you will be asked to fill out a quick survey uh, once you leave the webinar. We would love for you to complete the survey as it helps us measure our outreach and is also used for grant reporting purposes so we can continue doing events like these. Uh, so today we are joined by Billy Heron. Uh, Billy lives in Grand Island and became a volunteer at the Crane Trust Nature and Visitor Center 11 years ago. Over the years, she has worked for the Grand Island Convention and Visitors Bureau stationed at the Trust, uh, taking care of area and state information. She is also a point of contact person uh, for Conservation Nebraska stationed at the Crane Trust, where she is in charge of volunteers. She is also a photographer and has spent a great deal of time learning about and observing the Sandhill Cranes, as well as other wildlife that live on and rely on the Platte River for their survival. So Billy, whenever you're ready, Go ahead. Very good. Hi, welcome to welcome to the Crane Trust Nature and Visitor Center. Normally, we would be saying this a hundred times a day, but right now, unfortunately, we are closed due to COVID. So tonight, we're just going to be in the main room of the of the center. I will be talking about the Sandhill Cranes. Right here, you'll see a couple of of our birds. 60 to 80, 60 to 65% of our birds are the lesser sandhill crane. This is this little guy right here. He's about three foot. Right over here is our greater sandhill crane. He tops out about four foot. These guys come through the month of February, they start to come out. We will have up to 500,000 birds during the month of March. This is the only place in the world you'll see this migration. While they're here, they will stay for three, three and a half weeks. This is their stopping area to fuel up. They have, they have taken their trip from the Gulf of, of Mexico around Texas area. They'll come up through the narrow strip of the Platte River and they will roost here for three, three and a half weeks. While they are here, they'll hang out on the Platte River. This shows you in back what it looks like when they are roosting. They're an aquatic bird. They do not roost in trees, so they will hang out in the Platte River all night. In the morning, they'll fly out to our cornfields where they, where they fuel up. Again, they'll be here three, three and a half weeks. This little guy here, when they leave here, some of them will fly as far as Siberia. Normally they'll go up to around Canada, to the wetlands up here, up there. There are seven varieties of Sandhill Crane in the United States. The lesser, the greater, as we have here. There's also cranes in Florida, Alabama, Louisiana area and in Canada and Puerto Rico. Now those guys mostly they don't they don't even hibernate. They have it pretty well made down there. People feed them. They become kind of domesticated down in Florida. While they're on the river, again their main course, their main reason is to feel is to fuel up. So in the river they're eating plankton, they're eating minnows. In the mornings, they'll fly out to the cornfields. Now, these birds have been doing the same migration for 10 million years. Back then, what they were eating was roots and, and little green grass. Um, they will eat, in, they'll eat snakes. If it moves, it dies. 
they're, they, again, they're, they're, they will eat anything. But when the farmer come along and started planting corn, these birds were so excited. Oh my God, they really love us in Nebraska because now they're feeding us corn. So now most of their diet is on corn. And of course they're helping the farmer. They're, they're cleaning up the farmer's fields with the leftover corn. Uh, they're also leaving a natural deposit uh, of fertilizer. In the mornings, again, they'll fly out. They will leave about sunrise. Now, if you ever get a chance to come out and see the migration, if you came to see them leave the river in the morning, as the sun rises on the Platte River and you see thousands of birds and they take off, it is amazing, amazing. I, it, it takes your breath away. At night, when they come back to the river, they will stage on the other side of the river. They'll stop over there before dark and they'll get, they'll have like a little cocktail hour, we call it. They chitter chatter. They're very family oriented, very social. So you'll see lots and lots. Of, these are all families that are out there talking. So Martha's talking to Peggy going, how's the kids? Haven't seen you for a year. You know, what's going on? The little males are checking out the females and they're just so happy to be here. Then as the sun sets, they all turn around and go back and roost on the river. It's an amazing sight. Right over here, we'll show you one that looks what it looks like when he's flying. This is in flight. Their wingspan is about four foot. There again, you can see their feet, their aquatic foot. Now on their, and unfortunately you won't be able to see it as well. <clears throat> on their beak, a sandhill crane has what we call a little sewing needle. Instead of a duck having his air holes on either side of his bill, the central crane will have his right inside of his bill. Over here, we also have a whooping crane. I'm gonna switch you over here a little bit. Can you see the whooping crane? There's too much sun. I think we're good. Okay. It's a little. A little bit. This is the whooping crane. <clears throat> the whooping crane <clears throat> also migrates through Nebraska. The whooping crane is Nebraska's, it is, I'm sorry, is the, is, North America's largest bird. He stands at seven, it's between seven and eight feet tall. We do have the whooping crane that comes through. Now the whooping crane at one time was, was so endangered that there were only 14 in the wild. We have now in our section, we have a very, a very strong migration, a very strong populated of of uh, whooping cranes, we're up to around 500. But they were hunted for that beautiful plumage, their white feathers, women loved them on their hats. So they were down to 14 in the wild at one time. These guys here will mate for life. When you, the male is called a roan. I'm gonna move you back over here. The male is called a roan. The female is called a mare, and their babies are called colts. Now, when they get up to Canada, where they have their uh, nesting grounds, the female will set back, and the male, the roan, will go out and he'll look for a suitable nest. He'll bring the female over. If she doesn't like it, he'll keep looking. If she, if she accepts it, then they will turn around and mate, and she will have one egg. And then six to seven days later, have a second egg. This is in, in, in hopes of having one to two colts, as a, a, a baby crane is called. They do mate for life. If they cannot mate, they will separate and find a partner that they can mate with. Their, their main purpose in life is eat, fly and mate. Now I'm gonna move you over a little bit. We're gonna to go to a board over here. I'll take you for a little walk. It's awfully strange to be in this building by ourselves. Normally this building 
is so busy. Over here is our light up board. Now, if you came in to visit the San visit the Crane Trust, we have we have some of the best volunteers around. A volunteer would turn around and say, hi, how you doing? And they would bring you in here. They'd start talking about the cranes. We all love to talk about Sandhill Cranes. Right here is our light board. Now, I'm hoping you can see this. This shows you where the Sandhill Crane is coming from. He comes up from this narrow area right onto here, Aransas National Park, the uh, Gulf Coast. And he comes up through this very narrow strip of the Platte River between Grand Island and North Platte. This is the only place in the world that you'll see that. When they leave, this is where they'll head up to. Again, some as far as Siberia. Now, Jane Goodall compares this migration of the San Diego Crane to that of the Serengeti. It's a once, it's, it's the only place in the world. This is their nesting grounds, again. Now down through here, there's nesting grounds down through here, but up through here in Canada is, is the majority of the lesser greater sandhill cranes. Now when they winter, they will turn around by September and the babies will be ready to fly. The babies, the colts will stay with their parents for two years. By September, they're ready to fly they come back down. They, they don't stop in the, in the numbers that they do going out. By then they have already filled up, they're ready. They're gonna get down here as soon as they can because it's getting cold. They can do about 200, 300 mile, miles a day. Um, they will get down here. They'll be down here nest, this is where they'll spend their winter. Now right here, this shows you the whooping crane. The, the uh, Crane Trust Nature and Visitor Center is set up by the, the Whooping Crane Foundation. This is a preservation of both Sandhill and Whooping Crane. Right here, this shows you the strong. This is our flyaway right through here. And that's a very strong flyaway. Over here, we have a lesser flyaway. Hopefully this one will, will someday come back out. Um, it's, its numbers are dwindling down to about 100. Over here, we have other sandhill cranes. Now, we do have the, sand, the greater sandhill crane. He will go all along through here and up in through here. They will, <clears throat> they will migrate down from Florida up in through here. We do have a whooping crane that comes back every year. His name, we call him Bob. Bob is a celebrity. He's been in several newspapers. And if you Google Bob the Whooping Crane, he'll come up. Bob comes through with the Sancho Cranes. Now, he, he may have been a juvenile that was abandoned, um, or maybe he was hatched. You know, his parents died, were gone, and a Sancho Crane hatched him. We don't know. But he will never mate. He will be a bachelor all his life. They do not inter intermix. The, the Sandhill Crane has been doing this migration for over 10 million years. We do have fossils that show that. And, the, and uh, they, uh, they live to be around 20, 25 years old. Again, this shows you. Now, this narrow strip right through here, the reason they come here, the Platte River, it's very shallow. If you went to cross it as a pioneer, they took their Conestoga wagons through here because it was, as they say, the Platte River was a mile wide and three inches deep. With conservation efforts, we have managed to keep it without trees. Uh, we keep it, we keep it so that the sandbars are, are treeless, so that the uh, Sandhill Crane has a place to live. They stay out on the on the, the uh, river at night because the sand the, the, the sand in the Platte River is like quicksand. So if a coyote wanted to go after them, he put his paws in there and he would sink, and it scares him. So they have virtually no predators at night when they're on that Platte River, and they're quite content. How are we doing on time there? 
You're going to keep on going. Okay. I, I'm not sure what else you'd like to me to talk about. Um, <laughs> I'm a little lost for words right now. Billy, could you talk a little bit about the celebrities that you've seen, like such as Jane Goodall and Mingleson? We, we do have several people that come out. Um, Jane Goodall and Thomas Mingleson have been on 60 Minutes talking about the Sand Hill, Hill crane migration. Um, they did one, a piece where they're sitting along the river and they're looking at the sand hills and it's, it's just a breath, breathtaking view. The, uh, the amount of money that is generated because of these birds, um, motels, they do the motels and of course people when they're here, they're gonna eat. So they're doing other activities also besides the sand hill cranes. So we generate, it's, it's a multi-million dollar business here. And then again, of course, we have the Crane Trust. Um, we are a nonprofit, but we have an amazing gift shop. And uh, we love seeing people come out and talk to us. We also have a little snack bar that I, I'm quite active with. So we, we have, it, it, has been, it has become a money, money maker. Now, when I grew up in Nebraska, we knew we had the Santo Cranes. They, we had them in the cornfield back behind me. But it wasn't until probably the 70s, mid 70s, late, late 70s, 80s, that people started realizing that if we don't start conserving what we have, we will lose it. So what we do here at the Crane Trust, we will turn around and have controlled burns right on the river, we'll get rid of all the vegetations, the, the uh, invasive veg vegetation, trees. We have, well, they'll go down and they'll get rid of the trees. In the early 1800s, we had no trees here. These trees out here now are, are, diff are new. Uh, when the pioneers first came, all they had was buffalo grass. So they would look for miles and see nothing but these tall, this tall buffalo grass. Uh, we had no trees. The pioneer would use bison chips as fuel. Well, the sand hill crane loves that. He, he, won't, he won't go where there's a lot of trees. He wants a wide open space. So we, that is our main function here is to keep the environment open for that crane. Do I have any questions? We do have a question. Can you hear me okay, Billy? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so from Linda Jones, we have a question. She wants to know if it gets too cold for the cranes during February, and how is climate change threatening the cranes? The cranes are, the way that, that the crane, I'm gonna take you back over here and show you on this one. The crane, the way he is designed, his legs, <clears throat> his legs, the circular system in his legs, they run hot and cold right next to each other. So he's able to sit in, in, in a cold river and still survive. Now, I don't know if anybody remembers the ice storm we had late 80s. We did lose quite a few cranes then, but normally a sandhill crane will be quite, quite fine. Um, it takes an awful lot. They're very residual birds. Um, the environment, more and more, we're losing the environment. Um, people are building everywhere. You know, along the Platte River, it's owned by every, every, everybody owns a piece of the Platte River. It's, we have dams on the river. That takes away from the birds. Um, again, we keep the river clean free of the trees and stuff for the bird, but that's that's not done everywhere. Uh, Rose Sanctuary is, is uh, another one that is has on the same mission, to keep the rivers free and open for the Sancho Crane. Okay, Billy, we have another question. Um, thank you for um, answering that. And 
Um, Kevin Nelson would like to know how long has this been going on, meaning the cranes coming to the plant? We have fossils to prove that the, the sandhill crane has been doing this migration for 10 million years. We are, yeah, it's, and we're hoping for another 10 million after this. That's right. That'd be great. Um, do we have any more questions for Billy? Um, now it's your chance to ask the experts here. Uh -huh, not much of an expert. Again, <laughs> one of the advantages of having all of us volunteer here at the, at the Sandhill, at the uh, Crane Trust, each person learns different parts. Uh, again, we all we all work as a team when it comes to talking about the Sancho Crane. Um, when I first came here, I didn't know a thing about them. So I have, you know, learned bits and pieces of my knowledge. I've been very fortunate um, to read up on them. Um, I hope that people get a chance to come out next year when, when we are again up and running, hopefully. Um, not only see the birds, but stop in and say hi to us. We all love to talk about our birds. They, uh, when you sit in the field and watch them, you'll watch a sandhill crane jump up and down and he's so happy. He'll throw sticks in the air and he'll stomp around and they just chatter. It's, it's a whole family. There's mom, dad, babies, there's aunts, sometimes grandma and grandpa. It's, it's very family orientated and it's, it's all groups of families. I can certainly understand it now that I've seen it myself for the first time, Billy. And I hope that the Crane Trust does get to open very soon. We have another question from Linda Jones and she's asking, can we instill, uh, excuse me, install a law that no one can develop on the river? Oregon does that with their coastline. Unfortunately, I don't see that happening. Um, again, because the river is, we have farmers that need that water. Um, everybody has a piece of this river, whether it's Colorado, Kansas. Um, we, here in Nebraska, we do have it as the Sandhill Cranes are, as a, they, they are not being able to be hunted, where they are being hunted in Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas. South Dakota, North Dakota, and, and Canada. It's, it's legal to hunt a sandhill crane. Um, we have so many environmentalists that work with trying to keep this river um, as clean and as possible, but to pass laws, I, that again, that would be above mine. I, I, I really don't know, but I do know that this river is owned by everybody, you know, it's, we're very fortunate to own the parts that we do here at the trust and Rose Sanctuary, the same thing. They are very fortunate to have what they do so that we have somebody who is preserving that area. But uh, unless you are a farmer who really takes care, who's con who is a conservationist and is into the cranes himself, no, they, they more or less leave it as it is. That's, um, I can understand. Uh that. Um, Billy, we have another question here, uh, Jenny Ayers, um, and I apologize if I, if I butcher anybody's name. Um, has the trust ever thought about making the Platte River a national river? Oh, I, you know, that's a really good question. Again, that is not something I, I am, I'm, as they say, the low man on the totem pole. I don't know what the specifics on that would be. Um, I like I like the way she thinks, but uh, the the Platte River is a is the world's largest is is the nation's largest bra braided river. That means we have a lot of channels, and uh, it's used its main purpose is for irrigation now. So I don't know what the what the specifics would be on how to do that. Um, that might be something that she could send to the Crane Trust itself, and uh, one of one of the others could answer. I'm afraid I don't really have that answer. 
Okay. Um, we have a couple more questions and from Linda Jones. Again, did the Keystone Pipeline endanger the river? Not as much as it would have the aquifer, the Ogallala Aquifer. Now the water table in Nebraska is very low. You can dig five, six feet and hit water. We have the, world, <clears throat> we have the world's largest aquifer in Ogallala. And the pipeline, and of course this might be political and I really don't want to uh, start anything, but in my opinion, I would worry about it because of, of, our, of, of our aquifer. Um, there are others that say that there's, there is no danger. Um, I don't know if I'd want to take the chance. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, Kevin Nelson wants to know if they are hunted here in Nebraska. No, sand hill cranes are not hunted in Nebraska. They are considered an endangered species here. We do not hunt them. It is illegal to hunt a, a, a sand hill crane. Um, now, as, when I was a child, uh, back in the early 60s, my brother actually did shoot one and uh, he cooked it. And, you know, Mikey always eats everything. Well, I was Mikey. It didn't taste that good, but they, they are known as the ribeye of the sky in some sections of the country. But uh, here in Nebraska, no, they are here to here for show. And uh, what an amazing show they put on. Yes, that's for sure. Um, do we have any additional questions right now for Billy? Don't be shy. I have one. Uh, I have one. So Billy, for next year or when COVID is a little bit, hopefully, um, done with. Do you want to explain some of the things you can do at the Crane Trust, like the prime time to visit? Oh, sure. Um, as I said before, the birds start arriving. We start getting recordable numbers in February. But to really enjoy the magic of the San Joe Crane, they peak usually about the middle of March. So as, as you come to, the San Joe, come to the Crane Trust, you would walk in the door, we would greet you. We have a beautiful art, art exhibit. Um, we have artists from all over, the, all over our, our area that has, are showing their works for sale. We also have the, uh, a nature walk. We have 10 miles of hiking trails here at the Crane Trust. We have a beautiful gift shop. And then we have our blinds. Now to truly enjoy the Sand Hill Crane, Sitting, sitting, in the, sitting along the river in a, in a blind is probably the most magical thing you can do. You would go out at six o'clock in the morning, your guide would lead you out to our area blinds and you would park your car and then walk single file to the blind. The cranes, if you walked as a group, the cranes would think you were a coyote and coming after to hunt you hunt them. So they would, you have to walk single file, you will walk and you sit inside this blind, it's pitch black. And all you can hear is the deafening sound of the cranes. And then as the sun comes up, you see thousands of birds. And then as the sun rises, they all take off together. You know, it's, you'll see thousands of them take off. And you just go, wow. Then at night, we also have night tours, night blind tours. There again, you'll meet here at the Crane Trust. We would give you, we show you a little film about etiquette on, on how to, to, to watch the cranes. We would take you out to the blinds. Again, single file, setting at the blinds. You get there about six in the evening and you'll sit there and you get to watch the cranes stage on the other side of the river. Then they come into the river as darkness humps. And you get to see the setting sun with cranes landing on the river. Again, an outstanding show. I have had people ask me, which is better? And I don't think you can actually turn around and say one is better than the other. Um, after watching them both, you just want to turn around and say, thank you, God, for the amazing show. 
it, it is just, you know, just, it takes your breath away. We also have bridge tours. Now out here at the Crane Trust is again, as we have the 10 miles of hiking trails, we have a little channel of the river out behind us and you can set them, stand on the bridge and watch them fly in, which is a whole different experience. You get to see the, the cranes flying in off the, off the fields um, and they fly over you heading towards the main river. There again, for photographers, great shots. Um, we also have genetic pure bison here. Five years ago, we got our first herd of genetic pure bison. It was the first time in 150 years that the genetic pure bison has been on the same land as a sandhill crane. Now, when I talk genetic pure bison, I mean that this, that this herd is not mixed with bovine, a cow. In the 1800s, we had almost put the bison down to extinction because of overhunting. So farmers started mixing them with cows. So then of course that changed their DNA. Our herd is genetic pure. So as you're walking along the trail, you can see our bison out here. We also have several birds that are migrating through right now. The, the golden finch is coming through. The red-winged blackbird is here right now. Um, it's, and of course, the garter snakes. We have lots of kids that love to see the garter snakes. Um, there's a variety. If you're a nature lover, you couldn't help but love coming out here. Billy, I just wanted to mention when I was out to see you this past week uh, weekend, um, the the tangle of snakes that we saw in the yard <laughs> is it's called a, a hyper calibron, I think it's called. Yes, yes, like that. yes, hyper calibron. Yeah, that was quite an, an unbelievable experience because I had never seen that before and I grew up on a farm. So that was a unique experience too. You could probably see in the spring if you came to see the crane. And, and there's several of them and, and myself. I'm, I'm I mean, I'm not even a novelist. Uh, I'm not an, even a novelist uh, photographer, but I have gotten on the ground and gotten close up to them <laughs> just to watch and get photos of it. Um, and it's not unusual to see people laying on the ground out there getting photos of it. It's, it, they do put on quite a show, don't they? They do. Um, Billy, we have another question from Linda and she wants to know when will you open to the public and thank you for your wealth of knowledge. Well, thank you, Linda. Uh, I don't know if it's a wealth of knowledge or just that I read too much about the Sandhill Cranes, um, and I love talking about them, but uh, I really don't know. We have not set a date, and no one has told me yet. Uh, I know we would, I, there, all of us would love to have it open. It's so hard to even drive by here. When when the Sandhill Cranes are here right now, there's a, a you can go right by here on Aldo Road <clears throat> and go down two, two and a half miles. We have an observation deck where you can watch the birds come into the river. And coming by here and not seeing any cars, uh, not being able to, to be here and every morning. I make cinnamon rolls every morning. So I'm here like six in the morning to not come here and, and, and open and, and have coffee and cinnamon rolls and it's, it's hard, it's, it's really hard. Um, I know that I can speak for a lot of us. We hope that it'll be soon that we'll be able to, to reopen. You will probably give updates on, on the website, won't you, Billy? The yes, Crane Trust website. You can, you can go to cranetrust.org. Also, while you're there, you can see about becoming a member. Um, as a member, you can, uh, next year we'll have you have first chance to get into a blind. Our blinds hold 20, 25 people. Uh, we have evenings and nights. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, mornings and nights. Uh, we also, again, have the bridge tours. <clears throat> and you can find all that information there, too. Very good. Were, were there any other questions for Billy? Um, don't be shy. This is your chance to ask me a question. And if I can't answer it, I'll hopefully direct you to somebody who can. <laughs> okay. 
I, I guess I wanted to just mention one thing real quick before uh, we wrap this up. I wanted to tell a little about my experience having just been out there for the first time myself, um, grew up on a farm in Iowa and lived part of my adult life in Nebraska, moved to Colorado and then moved back. And I had to do that in order to finally see the Sandhill Crane migration. And when you mentioned the viewing um, stops off of the road, uh, that's where I actually first physically had my experience with seeing the Sandhill Cranes. And it was off the all the road there, Billy. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to admit, I really wasn't quite sure what to expect. And I'd heard all of these fantastic stories about the cranes and, you know, about how they're magical and you just have to go to see it. And I will say, you don't have an understanding of it until you're actually there and actually see them. And what I witnessed was absolutely unbelievable. And it happened right as uh, the sun was setting and dusk was coming. And they were apparently had been out in the field and they were coming back into the river. And I heard the sound first and then all of a sudden it's as if um, a giant hand flipped a switch and they came in wave after wave after wave after wave. And you literally can't take the whole thing in at one time. You have to kind of spin around 360 to, to take it all in. And the, the birds, they have such a melodic, it's almost a cooling. And I don't know if that changes depending on their, their mission, if they're actually driving forward to go somewhere they have to be quickly, or if that's sort of the nighttime sound that they make. Maybe you, you know, Billy. That's, that's their normal sound. It is just, and they, and they, they, they chatter like that all night. So you will hear that all night on the river. And wow. it is, it, it's a very, it's a throttle kind of, of yeah. And, yeah. and to watch them leave, when, they, when, when a group is ready to leave the area on a really, really nice day, um, towards the end of March, you'll start seeing them. They'll leave in big groups and they'll fly up really, really high and they'll start doing like a tornado kind of like, and it's called kettling. They will catch a wind current and you'll hear them. You can hear them as they catch that wind current and then they get higher and they get higher and then poof. <laughs> They've caught that wind current and they're gone. It's amazing. And go, oh my God. <laughs> that was so cool. <laughs> That's exactly it. That's I, I felt like the words that I kept reading over and over again were somewhere in mystical to magical. And yeah. I really wasn't sure sometimes when you read travel literature, there's a little bit of hype. But I can honestly tell you, as someone who saw this for the first time, that there is there is nothing like it that I've ever experienced. And there is something that is, is almost spiritual. And I would definitely say the word magical is, is the yeah. right word. Um, and you, know, when you, start, you start watching the Sandhill Cranes, you'll start watching the snow geese. They uh -huh. come up at the same time. So you have the white wasp goose, and then you have the regular snow goose, so you'll look out in a field and you'll see white, all this white, and it'll be the snow geese with the sandhill cranes. Hmm. Well, then out here at this same time, we have the, cheer, the prairie chicken. Now, prairie chickens aren't right in this area. We have, it's mostly in Mullen and up that way in the sandhills, but the prairie chicken is mating. So when somebody comes, they kind of try and, if they're gonna come from far away, Try and do the whole entire gauntlet. Catch the prairie chicken. 
He's a little bird that only stands about two, maybe three feet tall. And he's a very, the males are very colorful and he has his big, huge orange cheeks. And he will dance around his female. And he dances like he's Fred Astaire. He puffs up, puffs his old cheeks and he's trying to impress the female. And it's an amazing sight to watch the prairie chicken. I, you can't, I, I don't know how you cannot be, how, how you cannot get into the sandal cranes and not become a birder. <laughs> That's, I that's agree. I agree. Uh, Billy, we have one a comment and a question left. Um, Kevin Nelson said, true, the sound and seeing the thousands of trains is amazing. I agree. And then Lynn Barnes uh, uh, comment, I taught in Atlantic, Iowa and brought students about 30 years ago. There were a few motels on 80 at Kearney. Mm -hmm. Now it's really developed. Also, oh, yes, the arch yes. is great. Yes, yes. Carney, between Carney and Grand Island both. Now, Carney calls themselves the, the crane capital. We have the world's largest roost here in Grand Island. So it's kind of a little competition, but with 600,000 birds, we can usually share. We don't have that much trouble. Now, I've also noticed that in North Platte, they're getting more, as, as the birds get ready to leave, they will normally go more west. So North Platte is starting their tourism now too. They're getting, they, they have the Golden Spike Tower. And I tell crane enthusiasts, if there is a train enthusiast with you, go to the Golden Spike Tower. On one side, you can see the Sand Hill Crane. On the other, you see the world's largest switching station. So they've kind of mixed their tourism in together. Um, Grand Island, of course, we have lots and lots of, of uh, motel rooms available and they can contact the Grand Island Vis Convention and Visitors Bureau and uh, they'll gladly help them with any information. We also have private owners, private landowners who have their own blinds and they We'll, we'll have accommodations where you can come to their, right to their, their home or their land and do a blind, a private blind tour there too. Thank you, Billy. Um, do we have any further questions that you'd like to ask Billy or any comments? Um, once again, don't be shy. This is your opportunity. This person has uh, 11 years plus of experience. I guess if we have no further questions, I'm going to hand this back to Laura. All right. Um, other than that, we will just uh, stick around for a little bit in case anybody thinks of any more questions. I just wanted to let everybody know as well that there is going to be a little video that Rita put together from her time in Grand Island this last weekend. It's going to be put up on our Facebook uh, I believe just the Facebook um, that it's bet that to be out either tonight or tomorrow. Um, other than that, whenever you guys decide to leave, it will open Laura, up a survey. If, if Laura, I can add one more thing. If somebody is coming out to the crane to, to see the cranes, they can take exit 305 at the TA gas station and the gas station across next to it. I have left brochures and information. So they could get crane information there. And then right in front of the crane trust, we have, we have an information, little information kiosk where they can grab a map and that will give them an idea too of where to go. Okay, awesome. And then we also did just have a comment from Lynn. Um, she just wanted to let everybody know if, the, if you decide to go see the cranes next year, it's good to re make reservations early. Um, they sell out really quick, so making reservations for hotels or Airbnbs around Christmas is probably the time to do it. Yeah. And again, go to cranetrust.org, uh, set up a blind tour. That they go quick too, so there'll there'll be there'll be a link on how to set up a blind tour. Uh, again, go to um, Grand Island Convention and Visitors Bureau, and they'll help you out with the hotels. Okay, awesome. Um, and we did have a comment from Kay Snyder here. Uh, she just wanted to let you say thank you, Billy, for the informative talk and that she plans to come out next week. 
Oh, very good. Well, she should still have good viewing then. Right. And Laura, you need to come out next week. Uh -huh. I will. <laughs> I think the plan for me is next year. I'll okay. make a whole weekend out of it. Okay, we'll do. We'll, we'll set you up then. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Well, thank you everybody that, that turned on and I hope I did okay. <laughs> you did great. It was a very informative talk. You did fantastic, Billy. I wanted to thank you so much for being our speaker. And I also wanted to thank the Crane Trust and our, yes. and our viewers. They, they, they were very nice to let me come in and do my talk. So yes, thank you, Crane Trust. Hi, I'm out here in Grand Island, um, not too far from the Crane Trust, and the sun has just gone down. It's now entering dusk, and the cranes are coming in from the river, and it is unbelievable. It's just wave after wave of them. They're literally filling the sky, and the fields are covered with them. Sun's just rising, getting ready to go see the cranes. One of my favorite people is primate research legend Jane Goodall. Jane has said that the Sandhills migration is one of the seven natural wonders of the world. She also said the Sandhill cranes have captured a piece of her soul. I can certainly understand why Jane would say that after having seen them myself for the first time and experienced the Sandhill Crane migration. I can also understand why people will travel for miles each spring just to see the Sandhills return. While I was researching the migration, a word kept coming up time and time again, and that word was magical. And I wondered could this be true? I have to see this for myself. All I can tell you is while standing in the wide open with nothing to block my view, 
The sun is beginning to surrender for another day in this part of the world. It's turning to dusk and the sky starts to fill with color, ranging from bright yellow to orange to pink to violet. The wind is blowing around me and then all of a sudden it is as if a giant hand flipped switch and I heard the sound first and then I saw them wave after wave after wave after wave of cranes schooning across the sky coming in like an ocean tide and the sound grows and all I could do is spin around trying to take it all in. Sometimes the crane song sounded to me like a G note on a flute. And I would definitely say that the feeling is undefinable really, but there's a happiness and a joy an amazement and a wonder, like when you were a child looking at something for the first time. And yes, I would say that the word magical fits. The very reason that we see this great migration here in Nebraska is because of the beautiful, flowing, meandering Platte River Valley. Just as travelers follow the interstate, stopping for gas, getting something to eat, the sandhill cranes follow the river. And it's in this narrow band in Nebraska where they converge because they know of the perfect rest stop. We are so fortunate to have this Platte River here. That's why we must do our very best to protect and conserve it for the future cranes and for the future humans who will have their own sandhill cranes experience. I'm extremely fortunate to have gotten the chance to see them. It was truly a magical experience and I hope you will have one of your own someday if you haven't.